find the roll, Mr. Schron? Here. Mr. Tuma? Here. Ms. Stevens? Present. Ms. Baker? Ms. Baker's absent at the moment. Ms. Simon? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> She's here. I, I know I saw her. We have a quorum. Okay. Uh, is there any public comment? No, Mr. Chair, no one has signed in. Okay. Um, there are minutes from the July 29th meeting. Everybody had a chance to look at them? Hopefully you have. The chair will move uh, to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion in regards to the minutes of the July 29th meeting? Hearing no discussion, uh, all in favor of approval of the minutes from the 29th meeting, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, we have Ms. Baker, Mrs. Baker at the table, and uh, Mr. Miller is also uh, attending. Uh, please let the record reflect that. Uh, we have two matters to come before the council committee. Um, please read the first one in the record. Resolution number 2019-0194, authorizing an agreement with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum, effective 1-1-2020, to distribute from the county's general fund an amount equal to 40% of the 1% increase in the excise tax on hotel lodging transactions for transient guests in Cuyahoga County pursuant to Chapter 724 of the Cuyahoga County Code, commencing with the 2020 receipts and moving forward on a quarterly basis subject to the provisions contained in said agreement. Okay, is there anyone here that, uh, from the uh, executive's office that are prepared to, to speak on behalf of this? Excuse me? She's on her way, okay. She is, uh, I think they threw out a lifeline to Ms. Keenan. To, uh, you walked in right at the right timing. Uh, and uh, Council President Brady is here also. Get who he is. That's right. There we go. Okay. And the is, the matter has been read into the record. And, and uh, Ms. Kina, you're going to speak on behalf of uh, this piece of legislation. Hi. How it works, what it's going to do, how the, the mechanics are. And I do see we have uh, someone from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, too, to be able to talk about uh, some specifics of, of hall funding and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, Maggie Keenan, Office of Budget and Management. So what you have before you today is a piece of legislation, <coughs> excuse me, that follows the increase in the county's lodging tax by 1%. Um, according to the ordinance that, or the resolution that was passed, that revenue goes into the county's general fund. We are going to use it to pay down debt service on the Medical Mart, now known as the Global uh, Center for Health Innovation, and that will free up funding in the general fund that we can then um, allocate 40% to the Rock Hall to support induction ceremonies every other year. The remaining 60% will stay in the general fund. We are right now assuming that that's going to be set aside for improvements on the two sports facilities. Okay, but that's not here what we're here to discuss today. That's correct. Okay, so we are here only to talk about uh, the 40% allocation of the 1% and uh, how it's going to function, what it's going to do. Can you go through all the details uh, so that uh, the public can be completely aware of how this works, uh, what are the conditions, what are the condition uh, clawbacks that I think uh, one of our council members uh, had suggested uh, that be incorporated into it and uh, uh, forever be calling clawbacks the, si <laughs> the Simon clawbacks, I think. Uh, there. So uh, if you can clawbacks. go through that. Yes. Uh, so, okay, so by agreement, the county is proposing to transfer, as I said, 40%, uh, an amount equal to 40% of the bed tax to the Rock Hall every year. Um, that is in anticipation of the Rock Hall holding an induction ceremony every other year. Uh, I think Tim has previously uh, communicated that those induction ceremonies cost about 7 to $8 million a year. So there is a um, need, presumably, to have an extra year of revenue coming in to pay for those. Um, my understanding, per, um, so did someone say something? Okay. Nope. Okay, sorry, I'm hearing things. Uh, per the agreement, there is a uh, clawback potential provision. If the Rock Hall does not have an induction ceremony, every other year they are required to have an um, event of national significance or equal significance, um, and that is agreed on by the county and the Rock Hall, that we can decide if this is 
worthy of keeping the dollars. Um, uh, if not, the money can be clawed back. Also, I will say that all, this agreement, like all of our agreements, are subject to annual appropriation. So the county does um, kind of retain the final authority that if we don't appropriate these dollars every year, we cannot spend them. Okay. And uh, are you prepared to talk about any of the other uh, aspects of it, like an MOU or any of those things in regards to it? Um, I am not. Okay. And we'll let... Uh, Somebody from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame talk about that. So uh, as far as the clawback provision, uh, it's your understanding there has to be one of two things taking place, either an actual um, induction ceremony or an event equal to uh, that stature uh, as far as its economic impact on the that, county. Is that? That's correct. And if um, council, I assume, has the uh, agreement that was signed, it's section um, 1C in that letter that talks about um, what will happen if the induction ceremony is not held. Okay. I, I see that uh, uh, it's only been signed by the one side. It's only been signed with the copy we have. Right, because we're still We're still in the... Uh, we said signed, so mm -hmm. I just wanted at least to reflect for purposes of the audience that is not cannot see that we have this piece of paper that it's still... The county needs to so, still sign That's off correct. on it after uh, final legislation. That's correct. Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, for the Finance and Budget Office. Yes, Stevens. My question has to do with uh, the section. Is your mic just, on? Sorry about that. Yes, I just oh, turned sorry. it on. Okay, sorry. sorry. That's right. uh, my question has to do with Section 1C of the uh, draft agreement mm -hmm. that we have before us. Um, could you explain in a little more detail what happens when we don't actually have either A, the actual event, or B, an alternative event that both parties agree is substantively equal to. There's some type of forfeiture language that's explained there. Is it time for Tim to make his guest appearance? I believe it is, if I can. Um, sorry, I wasn't... That's okay. No, we, we'll throw a lifeline out to, uh, uh, to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame to fill in the details. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and if you can put your name on the record and then uh, go into uh, Ms. Stevens' first question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, I'm Tim Oftermat. I am the Vice President of Finance for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Uh, uh, nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. The, uh, particularly as it relates to Section 1C, the, uh, the amount that is by agreement uh, sent back or capped, likely, by the county, would be equal to $400,000, which is roughly the amount uh, that we would be, the difference between what would be received in the new agreement uh, in a given year versus what we currently receive from the 1.5% tax, not to get into too much uh, detail, so but there's a that four hundred thousand dollars per year <clears throat> is uh, the roughly the differential between what we would get under the new agreement versus what we get now. Okay, and so that differential would come back to Cuyahoga County oh, if I, neither A or B happened. Sorry, can I just make one clarification? Um, He's referencing the 1.5% bed tax. I just want to be clear that the Rock Hall gets that money from Destination Cleveland. So it does come to the county originally. We collect it, but we do transfer it to Destination Cleveland. We have an um, existing resolution for that, and then it goes to the Rock Hall by way of agreement. We do not have an existing relationship with the Rock Hall to transfer those funds. Okay. No, understood. Okay. Um, it all, for most uh, of the taxpayers, since it originally was generated by us, they still feel a sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. um, and so I get that we don't actually do the disbursement mm -hmm. to the Rock Hall. It's done by the, the Destination <laughs> Cleveland now. However, the amount that creates an estimated gap is from that base amount. So That's correct. So if neither A nor B happens, meaning we have an alternative event of some substance that we can all agree is equal to the Rock Hall party, or at least reasonable, uh, then this payment would be $400,000 per annum? Uh, uh, to Councilman Stevens, uh, the 
uh, the way the mechanics of the agreement would work is we would receive 40% of the tax uh, so long as if we were not holding an induction ceremony in a regular Cleveland induction year uh, and the county agreed that the replacement event was sufficient for us to get paid uh, the 40% of the tax, then the Rock Hall would receive the 40% of the tax. If the county did not agree that the substitute event was sufficient, then we would forfeit $400,000 each year. Okay. Uh, clarity on that, just so I'm following up on Stevens's question. If the event was supposed to take place this year, it does not take place. So is that a sacrifice of the 400000 for this year and next year? Because the next time that a Cleveland event would be taking place at the earliest would be two years from this year if it was scheduled. Mr. Chairman, that would be correct. So it would be $800,000 into that scenario? Correct. Does that answer your question? Yes. I, I thought that was a... That's where I was going. That's where Thank you're going, you. but I didn't hear you. That next question, so I, I went ahead and Thank stuck you. my nose in. Yes. Ms. Simon? Could you give me an example of what a substitute event would be or look like? Because um, uh, to the councilwoman, uh, if uh, we were able to arrange a, an event, a some sort of a gala event with significant national acts that attracted national attention, uh, we would likely make the case to the county that it was a substitute event if there was clearly economic impact related to that event. Uh, um, we would make the case to the county that it was a viable substitute event that created uh, national recognition for Cleveland and the, and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at that time. Have, I don't think we've had anything like that here, right? We have not had anything like that here uh, as yet. Would it be the intention of the Rock Hall to pursue an alternative in the event we don't get the induction ceremony? To try uh, to it, do uh, uh, it would be our intention to pursue a substitute event, but we certainly do not foresee having to undertake that substitution because it's our uh, desire and expectation to have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction ceremony uh, every other year. Tim, is there, uh, Mr. Oftermat, uh, an agreement between the Rock Hall of Fame and the powers that be in New York that this is a going to be a guaranteed event? I think I asked this before. Or is it just on, on a handshake that we're, we're getting this benefit? Um, every other year. Councilwoman Simon, it's, uh, there's nothing in writing. Uh, the, uh, it, as I think I may have mentioned when I was here uh, in front of uh, the Committee of the Whole the last time, uh, this will be the first time that we've, 2020, will be the first uh, of the events that take place each of the two years, every other year. Uh, up until now, uh, it's been sporadic or every third year. <clears throat> um, we feel like we've made immense progress with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Foundation uh, to give them confidence in our staff here, confidence in the Cleveland market, uh, and certainly our expectation is that uh, the uh, the ceremony will be here every other year. Thank you. So, our, could I, could I go well, along actually, with Mr. That? Miller was next. So oh, I'm sorry. That's right, Mr. Miller. We'll come back to you then. Thank you. Suppose that we put this in place and we we're going going every other year for a number of years, and and. Uh, and this year, whatever, let's say it's 2026 or whatever, this year was, was a year where it was supposed to be in Cleveland. And, in, and instead it was decided that, no, we're not going to have it in Cleveland in, in this year, but we're going to have it in Cleveland next year, 
after which time it will revert back to every other year. So in other words, something came up that just required that, that one year be skipped. How would the agreement handle that situation? Uh, Councilman Miller, uh, the, the agreement, uh, I think it would, I think you know, those of us that worked on it would agree that the document does not uh, contemplate that particular scenario. Although, as the budget director mentioned, uh, the council is always able, uh, via the subject to appropriation nature of the revenue stream, to not appropriate. I think in that particular instance where we <clears throat> were dealing with an unusual set of circumstances with a brief change to the cycle, we would approach the county uh, and hopefully with some sufficient evidence to make the council comfortable, uh, our uh, revenue cycle would continue. Okay, thank you. Ms. Stevens? Some basic budget questions. Um, if we're talking about uh, seven and a half to eight million dollars on average um, with a two to three percent escalator in that, uh, for a budget for this event, what are some of the major or primary budget uh, items that we could explain to the taxpayers or the um, important uses of this funding? Uh, Councilwoman Stevens, the uh, uh, over half of the uh, expenditures for this particular event uh, uh, come with the production company that is hired to put it on. The same production company that stages the event in New York stages it in Cleveland. Uh, so that's over half of the expenditure. So the bells, whistles, lights, technology, those a things lot of that are three to four million dollars. Uh, there are actually over four million dollars. Uh, in addition to that, with the event. Uh, in recent years, uh, the event has been staged at Cleveland Public Auditorium, mm -hmm. uh, and that requires the Rock Hall to engage in some additional expenditures to construct infrastructure for the staging uh, to make some temporary improvements to the structure that... Uh, that don't have to be made for every event that's there, but because of the significance of the event, the number of attendees at the event, uh, uh, there are some improvements that need to be made to the interior infrastructure, uh, and uh, we undertake those expenditures ourselves. Um, the uh, other significant expenditures include you know, while the typically, um, while inductees uh, uh, don't usually charge a fee, uh, we do pay a fee to uh, band members and other supporting staff generally that are supported by the respective unions uh, and their travel hotel expenses, meals, et cetera. Um, in addition, we often, uh, we often stage an entire week of events at the Rock Hall. Uh, some of them are free to, uh, to all comers. Uh, City of Cleveland residents are always free at the museum, uh, thanks in part to Key Bank. Uh, but um, uh, events that are staged particularly around the Rock Hall induction ceremony uh, from time to time are free of charge. And uh, those are also part of the, uh, part of the budget. So it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an event that, you know, it's a national, perhaps global event. Uh, lots of travel, lots of, uh, uh, lots of support uh, for folks that are here in town uh, for the event. Those are the major, uh, those are the major items. 
So last question, the economic impact of this event, what do we think the multiplier is? Uh, the, um, uh, we've had Oxford Economics do uh, semi-regular economic impact studies for the museum as a whole. Uh, and they did one for the 2018 induction ceremony. The, uh, uh, they estimate that the, uh, that the event generated roughly $36 million worth of economic impact. Um, the, the, the multiplier uh, is in the 1.2 uh, maybe just slightly under that range. Um, uh, for the museum as a, as a whole, the direct spending, I mean, if these numbers are meaningful, direct spending in a given, in 2017, for example, uh, was roughly $140 million. The total economic impact was just over $199 million. Um, interestingly, at least to me, uh, when I got over to the Rock Hall, 80% uh, of visitation at the Rock Hall is from those outside of Cuyahoga County, uh, and roughly 80% of those people uh, stay overnight, uh, either in lodgings or with friends. 94% uh, of those that come to the induction ceremony are from outside of Cuyahoga County. Uh, and the great majority of those, uh, I don't know what the exact uh, number is, but it's over 94% of those are unique visitors. So they are coming uh, for the induction ceremony specifically. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Simon? Oh, who is no. Okay. Just a follow-up question about what we pay for in terms of the performers and the recipients of the awards. Do we also at times fund the the MC, you know the people who announce or I, I don't know what Howard Stern was here for example for his friend I forgot who the performer was Bon Jovi he, who Bon Jovi so um, it was kind of cranky but do we um, do we cover some of the Miley Cyrus and 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 Howard Stern cost too to come and introduce. Is that part of what this goes to? Whatever it is, right? The whole yes, show. Yes, ma'am. That, Whoever's would, that gonna... would be part of it. Uh, we don't... Uh, th those expenses are sort of hit and miss. Some charge, some, some don't. don't. Okay. Uh, but if, uh, if, it, if it costs money to get them there, it's our responsibility. Okay. No, I, I'm, I'm glad it's, a, you know, people really enjoy this here, and I think even more than maybe New Yorkers who are a bit jaded by the extravagance of this this event there, you know, for us it's it's still unique and, and um, people want to go. So thank you. Yes. Ms. Baker? Uh, I'm just curious. On the economic impact that was, I think you said $100 million or more? Uh, 199 for the museum, uh, 36 for the induction ceremony alone. Why would um, New York, who seems to have been in control of the times that this would, we would have the induction change from every third year in Cleveland or sporadically to agreeing to every other year and lose in New York the economic impact. What is their reasoning for being more reasonable in sharing um, this event? Uh, Councilwoman Baker, um, with all due respect to us, uh, to Clevelanders and to those who live in Northeast Ohio, I don't think the economic impact would be quite the same for that event in New York as it is for us. Okay. Uh, it's a week long, actually more than a week, uh, uh, marquee event here. Uh, not to disparage the event in New York, but it's just another thing going on on a Friday night uh, in New York City. Uh, so while it is very meaningful to us. Um, don't get me wrong, it's not not meaningful to them, yeah. uh, but it's super meaningful to us. And I think the foundation has determined that because of how meaningful it is and how the Rock Hall stakeholders 
get behind and support the event and the Rock Hall, that it really does make it a great event for all that are associated with it, uh, even the Hall of Fame Foundation. So if I may, so the Hall of Fame Foundation are the deciding entity of where this will take place. Yes, ma'am. And was there, is there any pushback from New York? Are they fighting for this? Is there any, are they very agreeable? What, uh, I mean, that's a, even though it's a one night, it's still a big loss, I would think, for them not to hold it, plus the prestige of having it there. Uh, Councilwoman, I, uh, I think I can say without hesitation that uh, those that are with the foundation are very supportive of the Cleveland inductions. Uh, they like the fact that it's uh, something that brings an entire community together for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very excited about it being here, mm -hmm. um, and they like to attend it in Cleveland. Okay. Uh, and for those that are in New York, it's still fairly easy to get here. For those that aren't in New York or Chicago uh, or D.C., I suppose, it's not all that easy to get here. So it would be nice if that was uh, a better situation, but uh, it's still fairly easy to get here. So you don't anticipate New York lobbying the foundation to say, we don't want to give this up? or No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, just a couple of comments. The one is that you said that 94% of the folks coming to this event are coming from outside of Cuyahoga County, I think I heard. So yes, there, therefore, just to translate it to what we're actually doing in this committee right this moment, that means that 94% of those hotel rooms they're staying at, the bed tax is being paid for uh, by somebody from outside of Cuyahoga County. Uh, so what we're talking about is the redistribution of, of funds uh, that would have come in through uh, folks coming as guests to our county. So that's, a, that's all a good thing in that respect. Um, Mr. Miller had asked about the money in the event. If it, if it for some reason, God forbid, we should have some kind of a national disaster or something like that that skips a year. Uh, it would seem to me, even though the document is silent, that the money is going to fund the cost of an event. If the event doesn't take place, I would think that uh, uh, that even though silent, we would retain the 400000 for every year that the event doesn't take place, not just if it should, should miss uh, and go to a three-year by some other kind of reason. But that's, uh, those are the kind of things that uh, I guess lawyers get paid to, to figure out what, uh, what gonna, what's going to happen in that intervening, God forbid, should happen uh, from a catastrophe. Why wouldn't other cities that I see listed like Los Angeles or maybe Las Vegas <laughs> come in and put a proposal in that says that we want this event. New York is great, uh, but we want that intervening event. What's the, uh, uh, what's the risk uh, that, like the Academy Awards or anything like that, that they would uh, be able to put forth a proposal that, because uh, I assume we have to send some money back to the foundation uh, in New York? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, typically uh, typically we, we don't. No. Um, uh, the uh, be, this happened before my time, but there was one Rock Hall induction ceremony event that took place in Los Angeles, right? I uh, a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know the the details of that, but I think the common thinking among those of us in Cleveland and those at the uh, foundation in New York are that. Uh, our ceremony is trending toward uh, the Country Music Hall of Fame, toward the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the National Baseball Hall of Fame, where the Hall of Fame residents, uh, uh, whether it be Cleveland or Canton or Nashville or what have you, is the appropriate place for the Thank induction you. ceremony. Um, uh, uh, so we have heard nothing from any other competing city uh, uh, to that degree. Um, and if something like that pops up, uh, we'll no doubt be partnering with our public sector 
uh, stakeholders and uh, fight to have that stay in Cleveland. Okay. Um, one of the things that uh, we're doing with this resolution, I believe, is is, is doing some underlying uh, changes uh, it, that's going to be derivative of of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Destination Cleveland coming to some kind of also side agreement outside of what we're doing here. Uh, what's the status of the MOU between your two organizations? Uh, the uh, There's been one draft shared. Uh, I think we, uh, I don't want to speak for Destination Cleveland, but I think we've agreed as a pair of organizations that we didn't want to put the cart before the horse and uh, wanted to wait for uh, the council to determine whether or not the uh, the one percent increase in the bed tax was going to be split, and if uh, if and when that occurred, at that point we'd complete our agreement with Destination Cleveland, and uh, that agreement will include a termination of the existing agreement, where the Rock Hall is uh, provided twenty five percent of the. One and a half percent tax net of the amount kept by the county uh, for the arena renovation financing arrangements. <clears throat> uh, the the new agreement with Destination Cleveland will include uh, a payment from Destination Cleveland to the Rock Hall in exchange for uh, their support of the induction ceremony as well. Okay, uh, but there are also there's a payment also in addition that currently goes, I believe, from Destination Cleveland uh, to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, Mr. Chairman. Okay, that's that's part of the new agreement. Now, part of the new agreement. That's not the part of the current agreement. Uh, the current agreement will get terminated, and okay. that and that cash flow will go away. Okay, so your anticipation that that will be done simultaneously with this, or as close to simultaneously as as the two? Yes, Mr. Okay, Chairman. So the, so the one will go away from Destination Cleveland. You will receive a replacement that will be in the form of this legislation that we're, we're talking about here. That's correct. Okay, all right. Uh, other questions from anybody else in regards to that? Yes, just one. Just one. Thanks for mm -hmm. being here today. Uh, quick question. <clears throat> uh, do you have an idea as to when the next uh, induction date will be? Uh, it'll be in the spring of 2020. That's about all I can say right now. It's... Uh, <laughs> I tried. It's still okay. <laughs> all right. Still, still next work, question is going to ask who's going to be inducted to. Still working on it. Well, no, I want to know what the ticket prices are so I can start to save my pennies. <laughs> well, it, actually, uh, to the councilwoman's point, um, it, part of the economics of the induction ceremony over the years, the one that's in Cleveland, at, at least. Um, We've tried, at least, uh, you know, I've been here for one uh, Cleveland induction, I've been at the Rock Hall for one Cleveland induction ceremony, and there's a distinct focus on keeping a goodly amount of tickets affordable, uh, you know, so that, you know, you don't have to pay 500 bucks for every ticket to get to the thing, um, and... Uh, it's our expectation that we're going to continue to maintain uh, uh, affordable tickets to the induction ceremony. Any other questions? Seeing no questions, and uh, because of the fact that you folks are on a cycle to try and coordinate with this MOU, which would be, be it would seem to me to be best in everybody's interest to keep that on a on a on a moving path. Um, we have, based on the president's control, uh, traditionally have three readings, but that would still allow for three readings if this gets voted out uh, today. Uh, there's no need for it to be any faster than that, is there, uh, from your end, uh, that anybody can see? Uh, Ms. Keenan, any, any issues on that? Okay. 
Uh, seeing nothing in that regard. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I move that we... It's been moved, and uh, the chair will... Uh, Ms. Simon, you want to second? Move, moved and seconded. Uh, is there any other discussion in regards to moving this for the full council for a, a second reading? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Congratulations. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad to see that Thanks we're much. playing nice in the sandbox with everybody. Thanks. Uh, next, if we can read the next piece of legislation into the record. Resolution number two. And uh, I wish to also thank uh, our council president, uh, Mr. Brady, for uh, taking the, con the foresight to move forward with this piece of legislation. So congratulations to you. Thank you. Resolution number 2019-0206. Authorizing an Economic Development Fund Business Growth and Attraction Loan in the amount not to exceed $2 million to Redwood Corporate One for the benefit of the Redwood Living Headquarters Project to be located at 7007 East Pleasant Valley Road in the City of Independence. Okay, and who is, is there here, someone here to speak on behalf of this from uh, yes. the Executive's good, Office? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bob Flato with the Department of Development. Um, we are in, in the committee. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are here today with uh, representatives from Redwood Living Incorporated. Um, if I could give a quick introduction, we have uh, David Conwell. The, we have David Conwell, the CEO, um, John Latelier, the uh, Vice President of uh, Development and Construction, and I believe Katie Demet from the Department or Director of Human Resources is here with us today. Um, Red, uh, Redwood Corporate One LLC. Um, which is a real estate holding company of Redwood Living Incorporated, is requesting a $2 million business growth and attraction loan to assist with the acquisition and renovation of 7007 East Pleasant Valley Road and the purchase of equipment. Uh, the company currently occupies three separate office spaces right down the street uh, from the subject property. Uh, the company's relocation uh, to this property will allow them to efficiently have their operations under one roof and moreover, it will give them room to grow and add and hire new employees. Uh, so, excuse me, I uh, need to change the slide here the first time. I apologize for that. Um, this is, was just a little bit uh, about what I just said. Um, the, um, so, if we can talk about, uh, Redwood, the, their their company, um, Redwood's uh, Redwood Living's core business is in building and managing rental properties. However, their niche is in creating desirable single-story apartment homes. Uh, the company currently manages apartment communities in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, um, excuse me, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Iowa. Did I say Iowa already? Excuse me. Um, <laughs> so the slide you're seeing here is an example. Uh, of one of their designs, which has two bedrooms, two full baths, and a two-car garage. Um, and I, so, um, moving on to talk about the project, um, the um, what you see here is a street view of the former ADP building. The property is built in 1979 and requires extensive capital improvements to bring it to ADA compliance, uh, building codes, and also to create a uh, modern working environment for the company. Um, some of the bigger ticket items that uh, the, the, in the renovation include a, uh, an entire redesign of the building atrium, the replacement of the HVAC st system, installation of an elevator, and uh, a general gutting of the building um, in order to create an entirely new floor plan. Um, you'll see here you see here some photos of the existing interior. Um, the photo on the left shows uh, the existing atrium, uh, which contains these uh, obsolete ramps that are non-ADA compliant, compliant and uh, need to be removed. Uh, the pictures on the right um, show some of the cubicles that the company needs to remove to create a more open uh, floor plan. Uh, then these are... Um, the, the pictures you'll see next are some of the renditions of the of the remodeled property. Um, this this is the um, um, new and uh, the new atrium after the ramps have been removed. Um, the um, 
Com this is a, the, the new uh, welcoming lobby that uh, the company hopes to achieve with their uh, renovation. And uh, this is part of their new floor plan to show, um, to create an open uh, floor plan for the, um, to, that complements the company's operations. Um, so, Uh, the, the project financing, uh, to, the, to finance the project, Redwood is working with CBS IH Credit Union uh, as the primary lender. They are providing a loan of over $8.1 million to finance the acquisition and renovation of the property. They will have a first lien position on the real estate. And then Redwood is also uh, using a PACE equity loan, loan which is it's a unique loan that provides uh, financing for energy efficiency improvements. Uh, the special feature of this loan is that the lender doesn't take collateral on the building, on the property. Instead, the loan will be paid as a special assessment on the property's tax bill. Um, and if you'll notice on the bottom of the slide uh, that uh, the City of Independence is supporting this project uh, by providing a job retention and creation grant uh, valued up to six hundred thousand dollars. The county loan, the proposed county loan, is uh, two million dollars with a fifteen-year term at three and a half percent interest. Uh, the county will have a second lien position on the real estate, uh, along with a priority uh, position lien on the um, furnishings, uh, fixture and equipment, and the machinery and equipment uh, purchased with the loan and a personal guarantee uh, by David Conwell, CEO. Um, we believe this project will have sub substantial economic impact for the county. The company plans to create 65 new jobs within three years. The company's annual payroll in year three is projected to be $12,750,000. Um, moreover, um, data uh, from our economic development software um, projects that there'll be a creation of 11 indirect jobs with a payroll of $771,527 and four induced jobs with a payroll of $216,870. Um, as, the, as the property reaches a stabilized value after renovation, Annual property taxes could potentially increase from $89,846 to $325,214 annually. Uh, we also project that the county will realize a one-time sales tax benefit of $98,132 for construction material and equipment um, and an annual sales tax increase of $8,292 uh, based on uh, new employee spending in, in the area. The, um, uh, the City of Independence will also realize a income tax benefit of uh, 255000 annually. Um, and that is, um, so the Department of Development uh, believes providing financial assistance to Redwood Corporate One LLC will leverage additional investment, create and retain jobs, and increase income and property taxes for our community. Uh, the project was presented to the Cuyahoga County Community Improvement Corporation on August 28th, and the committee recommended this loan for approval. Uh, therefore, we recommend approval of uh, this business growth loan to Redwood Corporate One LLC by County Council. Um, now, I would be happy to answer questions, or I could invite our guests up to say a few words about the company. Well, we'll start out by first uh, going through questions in regards to the financing, the package, and what the mm -hmm. county has has to offer in regards to what you just uh, discussed, Mr. Plato, and then uh, we'll go into the company and find out a little background on them and then okay. go back and forth if we need to. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Plato? Sorry, yes, Mr. Mm -hmm. yes. Um The equity will be a cash injection for the borrowers? Yes. And then Excuse me, Ms. Stevens, can you turn on your microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Uh, then the next question is PACE equity. Is that the state PACE program that um, uses uh, sustainability to generate uh, the cash or the um, uh, a fund? You know, I'm not sure if it's uh, 
if it's a arm of the state that uh, it's Pace Equity LLC, I believe it's a. So it's a fund. Yeah, it's set, a fund set up it's, separately for energy sustainability. Yes. Okay. It uh, covers things like um, windows and HVAC systems and and improvements. Uh, like that. So are there specific criteria that they're meeting for their sustainability? So this is going to be a green, a, a LEED certified property? You know, I would have to defer that question okay. to the company to have that And answer. then on um, the Cuyahoga County money, the, term, the schedule and the term are the same? So it's a 15-year term a 15 and a 15 year, year term ammo? With a 15-year AMO, okay. yes. All right. Thank you. Simon? Um, this might not be a question for, for you, I guess, and I can wait. This is a question, um, Department of Development. We've given loans to projects and independents. I think this would be the third or the fourth. Um, and I just want to query about the contribution from the city of Independence. It, the, it looks like it's 600000 on a grant. Um, so maybe this is a different discussion about the context of the county um, putting money into the city and the city... Uh, maximizing the benefit, but not being on the hook as much as the county. It, I, maybe this is not the appropriate time to talk about it. No, I think it's, it's fine. To the it's sure, it's appropriate. Yeah, it, it probably Absolutely. isn't a question for me. I do know right. that uh, the um, in this instance, the city they're not giving a property tax abatement um, on this uh, project, uh, so we are um, still realizing property taxes from this uh, project. Um, in an amount over the years that will uh, be worth the investment. Did you want to? Uh, Councilman Simon uh, to, uh, and Chairman uh, Tron. Uh, Sorry, if we can just put your name on the record. Uh, so. Michael May, Economic Development Administrator of the Department of Development. Uh, Councilman, I think uh, maybe your question is more to the uh, point of what communities are putting into these uh, projects vis-a-vis the county. And in the case of independence, as you brought them up. They have, uh, we've had several projects now, uh, whether it was uh, Seven Signal or whether it was uh, um, Covia Holdings, uh, a number of projects like that where they have, uh, they've utilized their job tax uh, credit program. And in this case, the same thing is happening where a value of $600,000 of job creation tax credits are going to be streamed back into the company these will be the jobs that have been created. So they have a, a very strong vehicle uh, at, in that municipality with regard to tools to bring to bear uh, on this thing. We are cognizant of what local communities can do uh, when we are lending uh, to a project in, in any community. And, and we look, you know, we, we hope that uh, in our uh, uh, oftentimes see the community putting in um, a tool that in this case doesn't actually uh, amount to tax abatement that, that, that uh, sort of carves into the county a little bit with regard to property tax abatement. In this case, it's a, it's a, uh, a job tax uh, credit that, that, again, is uh, pretty hefty. Uh, they have one of the stronger tax credit uh, programs in, in the county right now. I, I'm not sure if that, uh, that well, is addressing. This, I'm just going to want to look at this um, after committee to see relative to all the projects we financed or loaned money right. to the city for a business there and how much the benefit is going to independence and how much skin in the game independence is ac actually has. And well, as you stated, skin, uh, Councilman, I, mean, I want to see how much skin, not the, the fact. There, there's a, there is a, they have legislation that's been passed. We can give you the uh, okay. letter from the, from the, uh, from the city. And again, they have, valued uh, based on the formula that they have uh, on their program, a value of $600,000 over the course of five years. I, I see that yeah. on paper, but I want to look at all the projects together, okay. which is for a different discussion. But sure. I just it's just noted that I think this is like third or fourth that we're, you know, uh, correct. Yeah, yes. they're they're one of the more aggressive cities. Well, it's so. easy to be an independence because they're they're sure. right on seventy. You know, the the highways there, and and sure. it's great growth, and and yeah. so this is yeah. in you this know, case I mean, one of the one of the key issues here is that they had a what amounts to a national headquarters uh, that certainly accrues to the benefit of the county overall as well into the region, and so basically what we're trying to what we have here is a city that's trying to retain that. 
that uh, corporate uh, that corporation that has a presence over seven states now and keep them in the in not only in Independence but in, in Cuyahoga County altogether. I so, understand that your yeah. position, the right. position of the Department of Development, that this is a countywide benefit. But I just question, you know, the benefit to the how much we put in to Independence and could they otherwise be providing a different amount of skin in the game when really sure. at the end of the day it's about their taxes that are reaping they're reaping the benefit of the payroll tax they're reaping the benefit right. and the question is how does that translate countywide to the extent that we're putting money in in into these these transactions well, that's my sure. my query and it, i don't and expect can, an answer today no and we can certainly give you a good profile say okay. for the last uh, through the this last administration for example maybe starting in 2015 to sort of indicate over the course of these several years what the what the profile is of our lending activity across the various communities uh, as a start uh, and see whether that sort of gives you a context and a picture that, that's more uh, informed. Sure. Great, I, I, great. I'm looking at independence, too. Uh, oh, no, I understand. I understand. Great. We'd love to have you both there. <laughs> moved our moved one of, it's one of my communities. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Tuma, yes? Yeah, Is thank you. Uh, through the chair. Um, so, uh, kind of just hitchhiking a little bit off what Ms. Simon was was um, discussing. So, why not just go through the traditional um, banking, you know, firms, what have you, to for the loan as opposed to the county? Uh, you know, it, generally when when we provide these loans, a business is close and they just can't get any other type of funding to make a, a deal happen. So. What's the you know nexus for getting the county involved? I, I believe this um, our financing does fill a gap for the company. Um, it allows them to do it um, do this project in a way that um, uh, enables them to continue to grow their business. And I, I think that uh, okay. It's uh, a, so it's I, I mean I understand. So it's a benefit for the company. Okay. Oh, someone's joining you. Gentlemen, okay. Paul Herdig with the Department of Development. Um, I'm responding to this because it has to do with the county's strategy. Okay. And my role in the Department of Development for a couple of years has been to make sure that work we do is consistent with the county's strategy. So in evaluating a, a proposed loan like this, we not only look at the benefit of the company, we also look at what type of industry it's in and what type of jobs are being created. Very importantly in this situation, the company is agreeing to creation of 65 jobs. These are good jobs, and that's one of the reasons we I can say we're advancing the county's economic development strategy in making this loan. That's in addition to the underwriting which our staff carries out. I hope that's responsive. Right. No, okay. I mean that that's, that is it's a good ex explanation. That's one of the things we're looking for. We're looking for what are we as a county getting back because these are again taxpayer funds. Okay, I appreciate it, Mr. Baker. Um, yes, just in understanding the total picture here, the project financing page, I guess it's maybe slide nine, are the uses and the sources, are they, say for example, acquisition of the land and building at 2.9 and the source is equity at 1.4, does that, yeah, is that money supporting the acquisition? Is that, are uh, these, we drawing? No, these, these. Um, they do not correspond. They do not correspond across the rows now. They're, okay, they're, so the they're soft costs does not correspond to the county of $2 million. $2 million is just part of the big picture. Correct. The um, county uh, funds will be used to pay for equipment is what we've, um, uh, based on, uh, like, uh, like I was saying before, the pace equity is more for energy efficiency type improvements. So those funds can only be used for certain items. Right. Um, the, you know, um, CBS IH credit union, as they want a, um, a first lien position on the building, um, we're, um, we're helping them with the equipment to be the most uh, feasible thing for us to do. And what is the, um, what is the dollar in for um, the investor for Redwood Living? How much money are they actually putting in on their own before they get into financing it. Do they have a cash value in or? As well, as we review this project, their equity of, of uh, near 1.5 million is what they're putting in today. I'm sure that they would maybe add some, would tell us that there's other money that they put into this as well. Okay. But I, the project I'm looking at is this, their equity is. 
right. Post it. Yeah. It would be, I think, good to know if there's more than, I mean, 1.4 million or isn't, I mean, that's, that's a, compared to the 14.4 that is being financed, it'd be good to know if there's more money involved yeah. on their part rather than just the 1.4. And it is, um, it is pretty much, it's kind of a standard in this type of project to do a 10% equity and contribution. Uh, okay. Get the financing from the bank and... And uh, to um, expand upon um, Councilman Suma's, Tuma's question, the, um, what is the bank, if they were to go to a bank and can secure financing, we're at 3.5 for 15 years, what would a, what would a bank finance this project for uh, there the, the bank uh, the bank's term on this loan that you see here the CBS IH credit union they have a 25 year amortization schedule but they only have a 13 year term okay so the, they're expected there's a balloon payment at the end of 13 years and ideally the company will either pay that or refinance the loan at that point what is the rate on that do you know uh, that is um, Sorry, I was looking at the wrong. Piece I just paper. wonder it's, what, it's, it's, why it's, it's, the county is such a incentive. Well, probably six or seven. It's that's five. Five. Five point one two five. Yeah, that's what I thought. Two five. Um. Um. Okay, and it typically is it from the Department of Development is financing office furniture? Is that something we we have done in the past? Maybe. We have done that in the past, yes. We have. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing for this loan is our collateral is on the building, even though we're financing the collateral on the building. Equipment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just to go through the interest rates again. Uh, we're talking, if you could keep that slide up, that'd be great. Can you wiggle it to keep that slide up? To, uh, oh, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, you're saying the interest rate is 3.5% is what we're charging? Yes. And currently, do you know what we're earning on our money in the bank right now? Um, I couldn't tell you that. Okay, That's I think we're earning. Question. Go ahead. I'll let, I'll let somebody from... <laughs> No, it's quite a bit under three percent, actually. Yeah, we're 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 barely we're below two percent. Uh, so, I, I, I think that was uh, from the investment uh, advisory. The loan, I mean, basically, we had a loan that was over. Excuse me, can you speak into the microphone, please? So yes, yeah. Now that uh, you mentioned that, yeah, we're we're well below the three percent. So yeah. So we're the margin is good here. We're, we're making probably one and a half points at least, maybe yes. maybe two points on this loan. Uh, so the back that the bank makes uh, is making different money. We're making we're more than doubling what our what our current money is is uh, is, is earning for us. I believe right. yeah, on, we're on, not, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're not that far below uh, the market rate that they're receiving no. as well. Uh, now we are, of course, in a second position. Uh, so our surety is not as, as strong. Um, you said that Mr. Uh, Conwell is uh, uh, is the personal guarantee on this. Uh, and how many other folks are uh, is he signed off with as far as personal guarantee on this loan? Where are we in regards to that? Bank. We're second position on the real estate. Where are we on his personal guarantee? Um, his um, personal guarantee indicates that there is sufficient money to pay back our loan and and any other obligations. He also okay, has. but how many is he also no, personally guaranteed? On? Order of guarantee, but basically the the, the uh, credit union that's. Uh, that's giving them the loan. He is also personally guaranteed on that. Okay, one. so we're in a second position on the personal guarantee, also. Uh, no, not really. We're no. We're, okay, we're so not, we're we're universally, we're guarantee. we're both in the same uh, same position in regards to the personal guarantee. Um, but they are in first position on the mortgage, which means they're gonna uh, they 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 have the ability to to move on that. But uh, let's, yes, um, we're talking about uh, six hundred thousand dollars is. Uh, uh, is what is coming forward from independence it is and we're in putting form. in two million on Correct. this Correct. so 
the six hundred thousand dollars is coming to them offline out of this financing. It's coming to them in the tax side. Correct. It's not part right. of the capital it's stack. Not part of the capital stack. It right. yeah. comes to you through the tax. Right. 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 Um, and let's see, Jobs Ohio. I don't see them any place on here. They are not in this deal. No, we couldn't get them in. And couldn't convince them. Uh, there was them. some discussion. I, perhaps the company can uh, 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 inform us on on how that went. Uh, I think there were discussions with uh, Jobs Ohio uh, that uh, that uh, in this case did not uh, did not produce um, anything from the state. And the primary mortgage holder has a balloon at 13 years. As I understand, yes. the, with the amortization, right. but ours is going to be fully paid for after 15 years. Is that it's my a fully understand? amortizing loan. Okay, right. so the fact that they're still, I mean, realistically, uh, they're on the hook for, in theory, 30 years in regards to this. They just have a balloon at 13. Uh, unless they pay that balloon off, they're going to refinance it again at, at year 13, more than likely. Yeah, correct. And we're done in two more years after uh, that. Correct. By that time, they will have paid most of the uh, the loan down. Okay, uh, and assuming they're they're in a good good right. position, they will be able to get a refinance. We'll be off the hook, and we'll be done, and we'll have made three point five percent for that. Uh, there's no grants in being no, discussed. There no, there no there's no giveaways there's being no, discussed. Uh, there's no uh, forgiveness factor in this loan. And this uh, is a uh, hundred percent straightforward garden variety loan. Uh, and we're making straightforward garden variety interest on this at a higher rate than we're currently doing on Correct. on our own investment portfolio. Yes, okay. Um, any By other questions way, based uh, on if I could add, uh, Mr. Chairman, we also are uh, ha uh, we're, we've got a priority lien on the on the furniture and fixtures uh, and equipment in this project as well. So, in addition to the second position okay. that we'll have in the real estate, we'll have uh, we'll have a primary position on the uh, the FF and E type stuff in the deal. Uh, I'm not not a big fan of having first priority on a fixture that's attached to a building. It's pretty uh, tough to we're, we're pretty at, tough know, to pull that to away. That, we're getting, is, that, is that what my my legal counsel was going to give me over here too? Yeah. Uh, we had what? Oh shoot! It's, we got uh, we, we got half this council is, is, is our attorneys. Boy, anything scary. we want to we can splice <laughs> into it though. We're also taking a position on the uh, on the uh, uh, the leases and. Um, um, assignment of leases and rents as well. Okay, uh, but what, what it looked to me based on the renderings it was furniture and fixture. It wasn't, um, there, there were no, there wasn't really much that we have equipment. I didn't, there weren't machine tools, there weren't capital piece of equipment or anything like that that have secondary value much in the market. Uh, no, but they, perhaps they can uh, give you a little more information. I mean, basically, we're going to have IT equipment, we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, all manner of, of office type. Uh, uh, equipment in this uh, in the situation that you'd have in any headquarters office situation. Okay. So well, we retain our position every time that the equipment gets uh, because we know what's going to happen with equipment in 15 years. Office equipment, uh, computers are not very valuable no. in a 15 year period of time. Do we continue to keep our status as it gets replaced in the well, market? We take a blanket lien. What we'd be doing is okay. taking a blanket lien on those things. So basically, what exists there uh, in, in its ebb and flow of uh, what would be uh, happening in the obsolescence of the equipment basically is covered by the fact that we're just taking a blanket on everything. Okay. Well, uh, other questions based on Chair's question? Yes, Ms. Simon? Just to follow up on, on the security for this loan, it, you know, it could go south with a balloon payment that there couldn't be refinancing, and then we're on, on the back end of that, depending on, at that point, the second lien position on real estate behind the bank credit union. What's the value? I mean, I see the acquisition cost of land and building of, of two nine. What what you know? How much it's equity is in this property, real estate and building to support? So this. so there is an as complete appraisal value of fourteen million five hundred fifty thousand. So we believe in the event if uh, there were any issues later on and if things were to go south that we are well secured with the um, collateral that we have on the. And lean on the uh, building as well as the personal guarantee. Which, which Councilwoman, is the standard operating procedure. Every loan that we do, basically a real estate deal like this would require, does require an as-is appraisal uh, to justify the, uh, the investment and to basically give us a solid indication what the value of the real estate would be if we had to foreclose. Okay, you, you, you said that the value, just Ms. Simon's question, is is going to give an appraisal value of fourteen five? Is that yes. what I thought I heard? Yes. I mean, there's, was, a, there's only fourteen five going into the whole package in the first place. Uh, the, the, the 
Well, I, I say again, I'm sorry. The, the, uh, again, we have looking at the slide. The slide value total stack is is just under 14.5. So how can the how can the value? Well, that's the that's the appraised uh, value, the as complete appraised value, what the appraiser felt the property would be worth after it's renovated and done by a certified appraiser. I mean, basically, they were putting a huge amount of investment in this building. They're renovating it, modernizing it, completely turning it into something that uh, is far and away uh, superior the, to what they have. And they, again, the real estate uh, is in great shape in terms of its location, and uh, it functioned as the ADP headquarters for a long time. Uh, but again, that, that's one of the reasons for the gap financing need from us is the amount of uh, capital and the amount of improvement that they're putting into this facility. Okay, well, but I guess I'm having a hard time coming up with that number because I only see acquisition and renovation coming up to about $11 million. Furniture and fixtures is not something that would get, we get traditionally some, appraised in the appraisal no, value. We can supply you with the, the and it's a commercial. Okay. If you can have that to certified us. Certified appraiser. Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Thanks. So what was the appraisal for the property as it sits today? Is that just 2.9? The, um, you mean the county value? No, as the land. Excuse me, Ms. Stevens, can you turn on your microphone, please? Well, I, I think showing an as is market value of three point seven million. So there's equity today, Correct. prior to investment. Yes, absolutely. This is mean, a good piece of real estate. It's it does have value to start. And then when you combine that, what you're going to what you indicate is, it's going to have a new value. Uh, it's going to get valued some point, at, uh, and they're going to be paying taxes at the new uh, higher value than the three uh, three point nine that, that you're talking about. Correct. Absolutely. And we're going to, will, it will, and independence will pick up that part of that tax, and we'll pick up part of that, and, and the independent schools will pick up part of that. Right. Yep. Uh, none of which is abated, none of which is abated, so we won't suffer from the right. sort of the, No abatement the, whatsoever. The, the yes. two sided, uh, the two edged sword. Yep. Yes. Mrs. Baker? Okay. So that was a understanding, because I too don't think that furniture fixtures and soft costs are going to be included as part of the value of the, of the building, mm -hmm. but. Thank you for the explanation of how they got there. Um, the 65 jobs um, that are going to be created because of this, what do you do to make sure that that, in fact, has happened and are retained throughout the well, it, life of the loan? Uh, uh, Councilwoman, uh, we have, an, we have a, an apparatus, uh, a job certification system that's actually well uh, well honed now. Basically, we uh, we f to start we see how many jobs are in the community as a base level, and then each and every year we have a certification process that goes through our monitoring shop uh, that uh, that gets from the company. Again, each and every year is the uh, at year end we uh, determine on a on a chart uh, uh, on a spreadsheet that they have to fill out over the course of about 12 or 15 pieces of information or fields of information on each job. But those jobs have to be proven to be actual jobs, bona fide jobs at the salary level that had been uh, indicated. Uh, we, we have uh, the last four uh, numbers of the Social Security number to make sure that those people exist. And again, they just do a reporting mechanism to us each and every year. We, we give them notice uh, near the end of the year, and then they, as we cross into the next year, they have to provide us with that hard and fast information on jobs. Is the number of 65 newly created jobs, is that over the time of 15 or 15 No, it's over years? three years. Uh, three that, years. That's the formulaic thing. Uh, almost all of our loans uh, basically have a a uh, hard and fast three-year time period whereupon they have to create the jobs. And say the 65 turn into 40 jobs. What is it that you do in order to... There are penalties. There is uh, a, an increase in the interest rate on the loan. Uh, there are some uh, warnings and basically a little bit of w room for them to explain themselves as to economic conditions, uh, situations that may have occurred. Um, and w the the ultimate is if there's nothing that satisfies us, we, we are able to foreclose on the loan. I mean, basically, they're in default. Mm -hmm. So now they do have the three years to produce all 65 jobs. So if they're lagging, say, in that first year and have only 15 jobs, say, or something like that that doesn't seem to project out, they still have that three years. And we, we've uh, – that has uh, borne out well with yeah. just about all of our loans. They, they have uh, – we have – uh, very, very few loans that have not met the jobs. In fact, it's usually the reverse. We, we actually have a conservative 
sort of aspect to this. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's almost always the case that the, that the company actually surpasses the job number that we, uh, that we uh, you know, that they said that they would do within three years. So you have analyzed this square footage of, and workspaces and, and realized that 65 jobs is a realistic amount of people, if not exceeding. Oh, absolutely, vis-a-vis -vis the square footage that's in the building. Right. And basically, that's, that's one of the reasons they're moving as well as they're expanding. They have, I don't remember about how many. See three separate office spaces now that are very cramped for the company and they can't expand because they don't have the room. Right, but how many how many jobs do they have right now? I, there's plenty. 100, of there's 109. 109. I think it was 110. Right, right. right. Uh, and again, they can explain this further. I, they in that they are uh, uh, they are uh, uh, located. They have 100 communities all over uh, seven states. Many of those employees are out there, sort of on the out there in the field, if you will. Uh, so, uh, but again, I, I believe again they can ex uh, explain that. But it's certainly on a formulaic basis, just in terms of the the amount of square footage of the building, there's plenty of room for that many employees. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions in regards to the financing stack or anything? No. I didn't okay. See How about Mr. Conwell? Uh, could we have uh, him actually tell us what what is it you guys do? Tell us about the exciting world of of what you're investing your money and signing your personal guarantee on behind this. The folks in the back are smiling, too, because they know that that's you signing the guarantee, not them. So uh, I'll let them down. I'm not actually Mr. Conwell. That's, okay. David, that's David Conwell. I'm John Lettelier. Um, okay. But just by way of the, uh, the actual project, for the record, that's John Lettelier, Senior Vice President of Development for Redwood. Um, it's, I'm the project manager on the project, so in terms of talking about the project, I'm probably um, you know, the, 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 one, the one to be here in front of you. David can answer any questions that we have as well, but... Um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a little bit of background on who Redwood is, why this is important to us, if that's appropriate at this sure. time. Um, so Redwood, you saw some of the high-level notes um, that Mr. Fredo uh, presented. You know, Redwood's a 28-year-old company. We were founded here uh, in Northeast Ohio by uh, Steve Kimmelman and Kimmelman and Companies uh, in 1991. He bought a couple of uh, apartment communities from Cardinal Communities. Operated those for about 10 years and then decided that single-story living was something that uh, resonated with our tenants. And so he started building the product that is uh, a, a generation of what we build today. Uh, in 2001, he started building. By 2012, we had almost 2,000 units. So if you do the math, that's just under 200 units a year. Um, 2012, we decided that there was a commitment to growth. Uh, it's just coincidentally hired me at that time. Um, as well as a number of other people. We were, we were headquartered in Beechwood. We went from 2,000 units in 2012 to we just closed our 10,000th unit in January of this year. Uh, we're somewhere around 11,000, 11,050 units as of today um, that we have built, currently own, and operate. Uh, and the distinction there is that we are not a merchant builder. We, bu we build for our portfolio. So everything that we're building and, and the investors that we have and the employees that we have at the corporate headquarters, um, we're building for that portfolio to build a company as opposed to what a lot of other uh, real estate companies do, which is to build just to be able to market that uh, investment and sell it off. A little bit about the why. Uh, you heard, you know, we have a uh, situation where we moved from Beachwood three years ago. Uh, when we moved from Beachwood, I think we were somewhere in about the 40, 45 employee mark. Um, we leased a facility on East Pleasant Valley Road. We realized that uh, Independence was actually a really good spot for us relative to recruiting. Uh, we then hired and hired and hired, and we're now in three different buildings on Pleasant Valley Road. Uh, some of us, myself included, spend our time walking or driving up and down Pleasant Valley Road from facility to facility uh, constantly throughout the day. So the ability to get everybody in, in the this, this same general geography consolidated underneath one roof for our own business purposes uh, is very important to the efficiency of, of running our own business. Um, you talked about the numbers a little bit. I had some on numbers on here, but I won't, uh, I won't go too much into that. I do have everybody's questions and things that I can answer. I'll try to kind of feather in here if that's, uh, if, if that's a good way to do that. Um, I think the important thing, the way that I look at this, and I'm an urban planner by background, so I actually went through school and, and, and did that for a, a living for a, quite a while. When I look at this building, the building was built more or less as an industrial facility. They printed paychecks. They processed um, 
uh, payroll, things of that nature. Th this building was not built as a corporate headquarters. This building was built in an industrial district where industry happened. They, were, they had deliveries coming in, going out. They had th their mailroom, honestly, is uh, probably three times the size of this where they did their mailroom. So you know, you were talking about 18-wheel trucks. You were talking about FedEx trucks and mail trucks and really fit within that industrial use. Well, Pleasant Valley Road, for those that have known Pleasant Valley Road through the years, has gone from really a very industrial area to also being an industrial and office area. You built 7100 across the street. It's kind of transformed a little bit in those gateways. And I really view this as a 40-year-old building that is pretty antiquated that was built for a different purpose as an adaptive reuse uh, into office. It's, it's maybe not the type of adaptive reuse that we see downtown Cleveland where people are taking the Higby, Higby building and turning it into apartments, but this truly is we're taking a, a building that was built for an industrial use, an industrial process, and we're turning that into office space. So uh, when we start talking about what the end value will be, that's the end value as an office building, not the end value as an industrial building. So there's a there's a gap in, in the ability to get there. The mechanical systems, which are aged, were sufficient for an industrial building, are not sufficient for an office building. Uh, they're 40 years old, um, in dire need of, of repair. They're keeping the building at, a, at an acceptable temperature now, but you certainly can't put 200 bodies in there and have that all work the way that it's supposed to work. So when I look at this from kind of a planning standpoint and a regional standpoint, I see the ability for independence and, and Redwood to help capitalize on a shift that's happening uh, in our economy, which is one from kind of industry to, to professional jobs and professional services. So that's kind of why when we're here and we're talking about the county participation and, and how we get from point A to point B, those are some of the barriers that we have to, to overcome on this project. Um, just put out there, you, you, you saw when you, you saw the pictures that were, were in here, um, you know, in this front vestibule, you've got ramps that used to be able to cart. They were, they were actually not built for ADA. They were built to cart paper and paychecks from floor to floor. They weren't built to the standards we have to build to today. Um, those all have to come out. We have to put in an elevator. We've got to be able to upgrade the, the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Um, the, the electrical service in the building uh, is, well, one, too big, and two, all federal Pacific. So that all has to come out, and we have to replace all of that. These are bones of buildings that when you look at um, what I would say is a commercially marketable office building, these issues don't exist when you're in a commercially, commercially marketable office building to the extent that they exist here. Because it's switching uses and because we're growing the use to a, a use that is, uh, quite frankly, worth more on this parcel of land than, than what was there before. Um, the, these, these infrastructure improvements all have to happen on that. Um, to address, I think, uh, Ms. Baker, you had a question about the number of, whether or not the, the space could accommodate the number of people. Our preliminary uh, space planning, and you saw one floor plan, which is the second floor, uh, shows that we can fit about 225 people in that building during the day. Mm -hmm. uh, as your, your staff indicated, the nature of our business is that we're probably right now between 25 and 30 percent remote working, uh, and that would be out in the field with our with our properties. Um, we don't know what five years looks like, so it's entirely possible that, that those 225 desks may have people at them. It's also entirely possible that this could carry us to 10 years down the road because if you take into account co-working and mobile working and things of that nature and, and non-assigned desks, all of those things that are happening in, in office space today, we may be able to get the, the tax-paying number of employees in this space to be higher than that 225. And in fact, we would hope that we can do that because it only makes better use of that facility for us. Um, I think something that, that I wanted to address, which is part and parcel to our industry, uh, everybody in the room, we're all familiar with Developers Diversified and Forest City and the other large uh, real estate companies that, that frankly used to be here in Cleveland. Um, I think unique to what we do, because we are portfolio builders, we build, own, and maintain that, is that we are not only talking about the jobs that are retained here in Cuyahoga County and most of decent number of our, of our workforce is actually resides in Cuyahoga County. We're also talking about the people who invest in the projects and the monies that we go and we collect in other regions, say Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, you know, we go to Des Moines, we build a project, we 
collect rents on that. We pay our, our, our uh, bills over there. We then bring that money back to the ownership group. And a large proportion of the ownership group is here in Northeastern Ohio as well as in Cuyahoga County. Um, I don't have the exact number, uh, but I'd say probably just short of half of that develop, half of that investment group uh, is bringing, you know, is retaining those those monies here in Cuyahoga County. So I think that it's more than just the jobs. It's also what we're doing to go out into seven other states, soon to be eight other states, to build these projects, invest in those, then bring that money back. And if we were in a different area, say Greenville, I don't know. I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying that. But if we were there, you know, you you would start to tend to do business with people who were close to you. And you know, we have a, a large investment base here in Northeastern Ohio, and I think that's a very important key differentiator for what we're talking about and what I believe Redwood means to Northeastern Ohio and 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 maintaining them here. Uh, full disclosure: I am from Northeastern Ohio, so uh, I have I have a lot. Actually, I would say all of our uh, executive team, almost all of our executive team. Uh, leadership team are from Northeast Ohio. We have a lot of pride in, in, in helping to bring that and advance Northeast Ohio the way that we do. Um, there was a question about the Pace Equity Program, uh, Ms. Stevens. Um, so it is the, the, the Pace Equity Program that's set up by the state. Uh, the specific vehicle that we're doing it through uh, is through the county, uh, and it's a, a um, non governmental lender who is issuing the Pace financing. So it is, are you dealing with Team Neo or are you dealing with our staff? Team Neo. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'm at the county. I, I appreciate the, the clarification on that. I just know enough to be uh, dangerous. Sure. Um, so it is, it's based on making energy improvements to the buildings. A lot of those energy improvements are some of the things I just talked about in the adaptive reuse. It's the HVAC. Uh, it's upgrading windows and, and caulking and... Uh, all the stuff that goes into, into making the building shell uh, more, more uh, weather tight and, and efficient. Um, this is, as, as we say a lot with the building of our own projects, um, green building is smart building. This is not going to be a LEED certified building. Uh, we are making decisions every day to be able to um, make smart decisions that make uh, good, solid business rationale long term. Um, but we believe that it's the way we, we invest our money that, that gets us to, to the company enterprise that we have. Um, and certifications like LEED just are something that, frankly, there's a lot of paperwork, uh, and I think we're doing a lot of the same stuff. We just aren't doing that, that level of paperwork. It comes with a lot of cost to do a lot of that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's just, uh, no, can, I just want to let you know. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm good with uh, questions. That, okay, you know, sure. Whenever, whatever, yeah. So you talk about the fact that you have pro uh, projects in your portfolio that in like five other states. That's correct. Uh, so um, one of the concerns for a public lender is that your job creation, uh, some of it be based here. Mm -hmm. So are all 65 jobs scheduled to be created here, not across your portfolio. So we actually see the income tax in Cuyahoga County the um, and the spinoff investment by those 65 individuals here in Northeast Ohio. Yes, that, that's correct. So uh, by way of the numbers, um, we show 100, 106 or 109 employees that are uh, in independence right now. Uh, as an enterprise, I don't know the exact number. It changes weekly. Uh, we hire about 100 people a, a year. Uh, we're somewhere around 425, I believe, employees uh, enterprise-wide. The numbers that we have is 109. Um, those are people who come to Independence every day and pay taxes in Independence. So the 65 jobs we're talking about are just simply corporate headquarters jobs. Um, when we go to other regions, you know, we build a project, we'll hire two to three people at that project, uh, and then some regional staff. They're not in those numbers. Okay. And then do you know what your average salary here is it? In here in Cuyahoga County? Uh, so at the corporate headquarters, I believe out of those 109 jobs, we have about $9 million in payroll. So that comes out to eight, somewhere in the low 80s. Okay. I missed the gross payroll number. Thank you. Okay. Keep on. I have a we'll, question. Oh. Oh. I'm curious, um, and even for economic development people, 
the credit union is loaning 8.1 million at 5.125, and we are at 3.5. That's a savings to you on the 2 million of 1.625. Is there, you know, I guess I'm curious as to why for 1.625 interest rate, you would go through all that you're going through right now in um, job guarantee, um, you know, personal guarantee, all those kind of things, when the spread of the interest rate isn't that great. And uh, would the credit union loan you the $10 million if you asked for the $10 million, or were you capped at that? Or So uh, it's an interesting question. It's one that we've debated internally. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I think the answer to that is uh, because our proposal is to, to use the funds for furniture and equipment, um, you know, we're in a, in, a, in, a, in a position of transition in our company where we've gotten to the point that we've got to start to aggregate our assets together uh, and talk about transitioning into a REIT strategy overall. Um, that re it requires a tremendous amount of capital, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of capital being pushed in that direction right now. Um, when you look at the, the, the furniture and fixtures component, um, traditionally, uh, credit union lending or or bank lending is on real estate. They won't they won't okay. uh, lend on those business assets that way. Um, so this is a, a frankly a, a an opportunity for us to come to the county. We 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 think we're benefiting the, the region. Uh, it's it's a it's an opportunity for us to come to the county, talk about that benefit, and help us to get to where we need to be to be able to realize the, the full benefit that we think we can bring. Okay, well that's a good answer. Thank you. You're okay. Thanks. Um, I think I don't. I don't know that I had that many more that I kind of start on here. I had pace equity. Uh, talked about banks. Uh, that was on there. I think the other um, the other salient point when we talk about pace equity is that the reason they call it pace equity is because it is that it goes into the loan as equity. So while there's a an equity amount in there that's owner's equity. Um, we've chosen to go down a different road and incur actually some more costs to be able to get the design of the building down to, um, uh, you know, a high efficiency, uh, efficient building. Uh, and the operation of the state program is for that to go in as equity into that. So when you look at the amount of monies that are um, going towards us in terms of equity, it's not really the 1.5 million. It's the 1.5 million plus the 3 million of PACE financing. Uh, pace equity that goes into that. Okay. I think I got everybody's questions. I don't know, but okay. I, I'm certainly Conwell? here to answer anything else. Uh, Mr. Conwell? Is it... You're Can ultimately you the guy on the, on the hook on this, I assume. Right. It's my personal guarantee. Yeah, so tell us about it. Tell us about, about the company. About Tell the personal guarantee or the... Uh, no, I, I kind of I I <laughs> understand that piece. Yeah, no. Unless somebody else um, has a question about it. No, uh, you know, first, you know, thanks for, for having us here. Um, you know, we're, uh, we're very proud to be in Northeast Ohio to kind of, um, you know, add on to what John was saying. We'll start from our vision. So, you know, we're, our vision statement is bringing our single story apartments throughout suburban America. So we started here in, in Akron, that was our first project, 95 uh, units. And we started building out here in predominantly in the suburbs, Medina County, Lorraine County, um, a little bit in Cuyahoga, Summit. And, you know, he mentioned the 2012 time period. You know, that's when we all came together, a group of us, and, you know, under that, you know, unified vision about, you know, hey, it works in Northeast Ohio. We had started in Columbus a little bit, had gone up to Northwest and Toledo Market. You know, this could really, um, you know, be proliferated throughout the country. So if you think about the suburbs and you think about housing needs and, and really, um, you know, the, the, the types of folks that we're catering to, what our product is conducive for, uh, you know, there's suburban communities throughout the country. Um, especially, you know, kind of adding on a little bit with what John alluded to with, um, you know, the public REITs, you know, it's kind of a shame. I'm a real estate guy and, uh, and I, I feel a little bit of the pain that we all share when Forest City got bought by Brookfield, when Associated States and DDR, I, I think they're pretty much down to uh, whittling down with, with a lot of their disposition strategies. 
Um, you know, I'm, I know NRP has come into Cleveland and they're a great company. Um, you know, we're excited to continue to grow and be a Cleveland area based real estate company. Um, you know, we're, we have a, a, a very entrepreneurial team behind us. Um, you know, we have private um, capital in the banks and you know, I think most important, our customers, you know, there's a strong demand for what we're building. And you guys have seen the, the presentation materials in the picture. So when you think about the concept of creating 65 jobs, that's a, that's a nothing for us. That doesn't even, because um, we envision uh, long-term having our red, Redwood neighborhoods in every suburban community throughout the country. And, you know, that may be a, a lofty uh, goal, but right now I think we're in um, six states. We're getting ready to go into Illinois. Um, that's uh, live. We have agreements signed there. We're getting ready to break ground in Kentucky, and we're doing market research on other markets. And, um, you know, so for a company that is doing a lot of neat things out in the world and to be headquartered here in, in Cuyahoga County, and, um, you know, I think that's a really um, neat thing that we should all kind of embrace and celebrate, um, especially as longtime Cleveland area people that we all are. Um, you know, I think that's kind of the, you know, the big picture. You know, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I mean, I could really talk about Redwood for the next two hours. So, Does your model succinct. work for an urban environment as it, opposed to suburban environment? It, not really. Um, you know, on, the way, on what basis? So we're a low density, you know, our product by the very nature of it. I mean, the, the highest density that we could achieve is on its best day, perfect piece of square land without any um, impediments might be seven units per acre. So, you know, it's hard to make any numbers pencil out in the, you know, the urban core environment. We're the one thing that I, I want, I'd like to really instill is the consistency of what we do. So, you know, we're not looking at a piece of land or, you know, that building right there um, or any of the other wonderful projects in Cleveland that have gone through redevelopment and coming up with a plan. We're, we're more like a restaurant concept. We have our buildings, our concept, and it's taking that concept and doing it repetitively over and over again. And, you know, so like we're more of like, you know, it's building out a Chipotle restaurant, you know, like that they, they do what they do and they do it well. Um, you know, I should have added, in addition to the vision of the business, we also have core values. And core value, you know, we have eight core values. And core value number one is do one thing really well. So um, we have become exceedingly proficient at building the Redwood product. And everything is branded. It's a Redwood apartment neighborhood. Um, all the buildings are the same uh, with some slight variations that we go through throughout the zoning process. But for the most part, it's, um, you know, the single story, two bedroom, two bath, two car attached garage, uh, green space centric type of development. And that, that pretty much is only going to work in the suburbs. Yes. Miller? So uh, the standard product, wh what's the... Uh, What's the typical square footage and what's the typical monthly rent? Okay, great question. Um, so uh, our kind of bread and butter unit, we call it the forest wood, and that is 1,300 square feet. Uh, we have some other floor plans that are a little bit larger than that. Um, so let's say averages across the portfolio might be 1325, 1350, something like that. I believe our average rent, monthly rent, street rent is around fourteen forty per month rent. Okay. 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 Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Simon. So, what neighborhoods are you in in Cuyahoga County? Um. Good question. Um, got a lot in Summit, Medina, Lorraine. Where are you in Summit? Okay, Summit, uh, John, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think of the, the, the county line. I mean, I, I know we're in... Um, we're in Olmstead Falls. Olmstead Falls, thank yeah. you very much. I'm sorry. Um, we, we, you know, interesting, I'd love to build more in Cuyahoga County. Finding land that works for what we do is, um, is a challenge in Cuyahoga County because a lot of what, you know, we, we have a, a certain investment 
uh, criteria that we need to meet relative to a little bit of, of the way we operate our properties. Uh, we have a full-time on-site uh, maintenance superintendent and a full-time on-site um, community or neighborhood manager. To be able to, to provide them somewhere to live and pay their salaries, we have to get a project to a specific size. Um, the number of parcels in Cuyahoga County that, that meet that, the, the, the right scenario that we could build that number of units is very small. Um, because Cuyahoga County is very well built out. Um, so there are areas that we would love to be in, you know, I'd love to be in the Heights. I'd love to be, a, who wouldn't be, but you've got a four acre school that maybe is going to come down and, and that doesn't work within our business model at this moment. So, uh, Olmstead Falls is where we're at in Summit County. Uh, we're in Hudson, Cuyahoga Falls. We have a, a pretty decent uh, kind of nexus in Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, we go down into, uh, we're in, uh, I guess Br Brimfield's across the line, but but Brimfield's there. Green. Green um, you go out into Medina, we're in Brunswick, Medina, um, Wadsworth. Wadsworth. We've got, some, I would guess somewhere around 3,500 units in Northeast Ohio proper out of the ten or 11,000 that we have in our portfolio. What's your footprint do you need as far as acreage for this model? Uh, 15 acres. How many? 15. You need 15 to, to be able to put two, two on-site people, support them, be able to maintain it, build build out whatever, three to five units per acre? Is that what I, I thought I heard? Seven in a, in a, in a, in a, on a best day, seven. Yeah, well, I was using yeah. yeah, I was using a semi-best. So, yeah. so if you're five or 15 acres, okay, so you're 45. Uh, you're putting 45 units into there plus minus two that are going to be management uh, of it. So you get, okay, that's a lot of, a lot of houses. It's a pretty big parcel. You have to find a 15 acre parcel. 100 units every time they break ground. So, so that's a follow up question. It appears then that you're building on on green space and taking away that aspect. Is that correct? And if you do, is there mitigation environmental? Because you're not going lead that sure. costs too much. I get it. You're doing some of it otherwise. But your footprint with regard to green space is, is there, how do you compensate for what you're taking? So I think there's two different answers to that. Uh, one, uh, there's the direction the market's going to go, which I'll talk about. And then I think the, the first question is about uh, finding, finding the land. So there's a lot being written in the planning world, and I'm sure it's, it's been on the news and stuff about the housing shortage in America. Uh, there's about four and a half, we're about four and a half million units shy of where we should be based on the economic expansion over the last 15 years as a, as a country. Uh, Ohio is shy, not four and a half million units, but, uh, and we're projecting another four and a half million shy over the next 15 years. So we aren't producing housing to meet demand. Um, that's in rehabs in downtown, that's in adaptive reuse of, of uh, properties, it's also in greenfield development. So uh, what we found is, is relative to our product, we do redevelop some sites. Um, we are building on a number of sites that have been previously um, uh, commercial uses, things of that nature. We aren't typically the buyer that would come in and take that down, although we wouldn't shy away from doing that. Um, a lot of times those are in some of the best areas. It's just the barrier to entry for redevelopment, uh, you have to get over the second component, which is the land use controls. So if it's zoned for commercial, price expectation for one of those properties is going to be much higher than what we're able to pay um, to be able to make the, the deal pencil, frankly. So we, at, at my core as a planner, I'd love to go in and buy an old Kmart, tear it down and, and, and build our product there and reuse that land because it's already in, quote, production. Um, the ability to buy those and redevelop that um, is, is, is really restrained. It's hard to find those parcels, not that we don't look at them, um, but getting to uh, a value proposition on those, there's, I can think of a handful of them, <clears throat> several in Cuyahoga County that I've, I've written offers on that are redevelopment sites that I just can't get to the value that that property owner expects out of it. I just can't get there. You know, I'd actually add on a little bit. Um, I think I know the kind of the basis of your question. And to add on to John, when you're thinking of Redwood, don't think so much of us taking uh, green space that are out in the suburbs and taking that away. I think that's where the basis of your, your point. Most of our developments, we're actually taking single family or cluster land 
that would otherwise be developed at you know maybe one or two units per acre and so therefore the the it, it takes up a, a larger amount of land to build those housing units and we're concentrating together in you know between six and seven units per acre so in terms of our um, from a global perspective, you know, we're in seven different states, so I you know you're not you're only worried about Cuyahoga County, but you know, as far as like a, a global strategy and, and what we're doing to accommodate the housing shortage, which is real, that's something that is very real in, in this country uh, that we're going to all have to deal with at some point, um, and and not to to take away as much of the the open spaces and green spaces and agricultural land that's out there that's unused. You know, we're, we're developing at a higher density than single family. This is actually a big issue down in central Ohio. They commissioned a, a study that um, a lot of the big developers and community leaders down there are trying to grapple with is the city of Columbus, which is very progressive in, in zoning and development, stuff like that. Um, I mean, like real class progressive. Annexation as well. Annexation. They're, they're, they're pretty um, phenomenal what they're doing. But the suburbs... You know, they only want to develop at, you know, like one, you know, the outer ring suburbs, like one unit per acre. And, you know, you look at the regional need of housing in Central Ohio and communities that are only willing to zone for one unit to the acre when they really should be at like three or four units per acre. So when you're developing at one unit to the acre instead of four units to the acre, you're actually promoting more of the taking away of the open spaces, you're more of the urban sprawl. You need more land to develop the same number of units, and the mark and it's counter, contra to the market because really more and more the the growing uh, demand of of either homeowners or um, renters they don't want the big one acre lots they actually want smaller lots less maintenance all that kind of stuff so, but people in city commissions and stuff like that they think they want to keep their density uh, low density so. I think, you know, while we're not in the urban core uh, redeveloping um, unused buildings and things, that's just not what we do as a company. You know, we are building uh, wonderful living spaces that are um, catering to folks that do live in the suburbs. And not everybody wants, I live in like South Medina County, so, you know, not everybody wants to live in the city of Cleveland or the city of Columbus. They do want to, you know, still live out in the suburbs. So, did I answer your question? Between John and I both, I, I, you know, we're trying to do our best. <laughs> yeah, but your your point was that uh, if uh, a development area has currently one to two acre zoning, you're putting anywhere from seven to fourteen houses on that versus one uh, out there. And, and your other point was that yeah. this property, two acre or two miles from here, is is pretty expensive uh, because it's currently zoned commercial. And if I'm the owner of that commercial property. I can get a heck of a lot more money to sell it to an industrial builder than I can to you guys out there. Okay. Well, maybe the other part of that question is that the cities don't want to rezone commercial and industrial property typically. So that's the other issue <laughs> that I think city planning commissions and, um, you know, we're talking about a $2 million loan, but, you know, city planning commissions really need to get their act together with providing more zoning for um, these kinds of kinds of uses or else there's going to be a, the, the, the housing shortage is real, and uh, and that's gonna we all have to come with a solution on that. So, hopefully, uh, with this corporate headquarters, uh, our growth, our long term vision, and what we're looking to do, that we're gonna you know at the end of the day solve real problems in our society, provide really nice quality housing at an affordable price, and um, create real nice jobs, and you know do it the right way. So, other thanks. questions from anybody else? <laughs> Ms. Baker? When you talk about the cost, and I understand going from commercial or industrial to housing and the difference in price of property, do you look at other expenses like, you know, property tax and other cost of doing business of what you would have to pay in addition to maybe what Medina or other um, counties may offer, although you also have the services perhaps that are important to your residents that other counties may not have? How do you uh, balance the decision-making process of paying perhaps more for services that may not be in another county, or is it really by the dollar? Do you look at uh, I can be I can build cheaper here than I can over here because of what I have to pay in order to reside or build homes? So one of the biggest, and I handle a lot of the zoning for for Redwood. I'm I'm on the road a lot. Um, 
not as much as I used to be, but um, answering questions like this. And, and the biggest question I usually get, just I'm going to share a personal story about kind of a day in the life, is why don't you have a pool? Why don't you have a clubhouse? We don't, we don't build pools and clubhouses, by the way. Um, and the, answer, the easy answer to that is the people who are moving in are typically coming from a three-mile ring anyway. They're already established with the senior center. They're established with the local Y. They're established with the services that, that they want. So, so those are very important to us. Um, I would say taxation and, I mean, it's all got to work in a financial performance, so it all weighs out. Um, there are states that are, uh, Ohio is, is a reasonably, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it's a reasonably balanced infrastructure when it comes to commercial taxation as opposed to residential. Residential is a little lower. There are states that that's not the case. Uh, so, you know, those states that uh, commercial taxation is sometimes the order of magnitude of three to four times what residential pays. Um, that has a big impact on our decision to, to build or not to build there. Um, and states that it's more balanced are states that we, we focus on. Um, the decision of going to Medina County as opposed to Cuyahoga or um, just using Northeastern Ohio as an example. We're, we're in Northeastern Ohio. We're going to do deals in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, we have, you know, a, a, a target of what we want to build in Northeastern Ohio on an annual basis. Uh, every site gets analyzed relative to its financial metrics and its, I'll call it, uh, external benefits. And we make the best decisions we can at any given moment. Uh, and then, Unfortunately, I just haven't been able to, to land something in this fine county since we built uh, Olmstead. And, and, and Olmstead is a pretty high tax city. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, sure. This is high, you know, they're, they're probably one of the higher taxed cities. That, so that decision there did not impact. I believe we're in Olmstead Township, right? Oh, Olmstead Township. Well, yeah. I don't know. He, okay. he did the deal. I don't know. <laughs> we're, we're in Olmstead Township, Township and, and okay. the real estate taxes are, the millage rates are, are on the higher side. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, it, it's just a, there's, there's a broader strategy that we, we look to execute and we're analyzing, you know, state by state, county by county. And we, we, we look into the real estate taxes with great detail. So thank you for your answer. Okay. Thank you. Um, what is the timing in regards to this? What you're present, presenting to us, Mr. Chairman? I would just uh, uh, say that if the uh, committee was uh, ready to entertain uh, passage under suspension of the rules, or at least as it comes out of committee, uh, taking that uh, to to county council, we've uh, actually lost some timing uh, over the last few weeks. Uh, and again, there's I think a, a real desire, certainly on our part, to close this long before the end of the year. So I think uh, basically, uh, you know, we have to negotiate. We have to go through a number of paces to, to get there. So it, uh, if we could uh, get ourselves another couple of weeks with uh, regard to not having to go to third reading. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, the end of the year is three months from now, so I'm, I'm not sure. Well, there are other closings that have to take place. No, I, I, I would anticipate Time is that, of the essence on this. So we, we, we've lost some time. I, I, I'm... I, I'm not ever thrilled about moving things faster than what okay. uh, we had a chance for public hearing. So unless I, I didn't hear a compelling reason there, sorry about that. Um, uh, I'm prepared to move this uh, on out for a second reading uh, out there. And uh, if a compelling reason comes up uh, between now and then, the president of the council can always move it forward. Gentlemen, make your case if you want it to move, yeah, please. <laughs> I mean... For, for the project for us, we're, we're quick in the height of um, design, bidding, getting ready to, to, to break ground on the project, finalizing the, the package for us, the, the, the entire finance package allows us to make those decisions faster and to get into construction. Um, it is Northeastern Ohio, so while fiscal year, you know, you talk January to January, it starts snowing in November, uh, yeah. hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so the ability to make those decisions and move things forward for us is, is important. Um, that said, if there's a strong feeling one way or the other on the board, we're open to, to whatever the board's Okay. Ways. Well, uh, the, the chair will move this forward for, uh, for its second reading. Uh, out, uh, if, there's a, if there's a second for it, second. it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion in regards to that? Uh, hearing no further discussion, all in favor of moving this for second reading, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Um, 
You've got to move forward. You can do your planning. Uh, I can assure you that the next biggest challenge will making sure you get your agreements done. So <laughs> there's no reason you can't be working on that simultaneously right this moment. Sure. Uh, but that's between you and and uh, the executive's office. Um, so right. I'll put the burden where the burden belongs at this point. Thanks, Thank you, Chairman, and uh, Thank you. and committee. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any for, anything further for the council for the committee? I'll adjourn the meeting.